Thanks very much. It looks like we've thinned out quite a bit since the last session, uh, but uh, hopefully I can make, uh, make it worth your while for those that have decided to stay. So uh, yes, hello, Ben George is my name. I'm from the ORE, Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult, and uh, we focus predominantly on offshore wind, but also wave and tidal. So for those that are, uh, have an interest in one of the fastest growing sectors in the UK economy at the moment, offshore wind, that's the area that we focus on. And we work, like most catapults, all the way across the supply chain, helping accelerate and deliver and test and uh, uh, field innovation in that sector. All right, for my role, I'm the head of smart operations and maintenance at ORE Catapult. And that, uh, what that entails is uh, when a wind turbine or a wind farm is switched on, so when the, uh, when the turbines actually start providing power, all of the activity that goes from there until it's decommissioned and returned back to Virgin Sea, which might be 40 years' time after the thing has been uh, switched on in the first instance, that's the area that I focus on. And my remit is predominantly to make O&M, operations and maintenance, O&M, smarter, safer, and greener. And so we work predominantly in data and digital technologies, robotics and autonomous systems, remote sensors, advanced toolings, new training techniques, uh, clean maritime, circular economy, decommissioning, all of those sorts of things that are vitally important to make sure that this industry can survive and thrive. And for those that aren't really aware about uh, the scale of offshore wind, so there's currently 12 gigawatts. So all you have to really worry about, rather than the gigawatts bit, is the 12. Uh, we've got 12 gigawatts in the water at the moment. And the target set by government is to have 50 gigawatts in the water by the end of this decade. Now, that's seven years' time. And it's taken us 20 years to get to 12 gigawatts. So as you might imagine, there is a huge amount of activity and a huge amount of money being pumped into offshore wind at the moment. The scale of the actual devices, the turbines themselves, so people think you know, the onshore, onshore wind turbines are pretty big. Well, uh, at our testing facility up in, uh, in uh, Blythe in the northeast, we're currently testing uh, a system that's 15 megawatts. Most of the onshore turbines you see are two megawatts. So the next generation that's coming is 20 megawatts, and that's going to be the size, like the tip height, uh, will be the size of the shard. So imagine uh, 100 shards being deployed at one per day in the North Sea. That's the level of activity that's happening, and not just the North Sea, I should say, also around Scotland and uh, down through the, uh, the Celtic Sea as well. So that's the level of activity that's happening at the moment. All these turbines that are going into the water need to be maintained as efficiently as possible and as cost effectively as possible for the next, as I said, 25 or 40, up to 45 years. So big focus on getting costs down in offshore wind. So how does that necessarily relate to what I'm talking about? So the digital O&M environment, or DOME, as we've abbreviated it to, uh, is really a digital twin hosting platform. And that's what we're trying to develop here. So why are we doing this? So as you can see, and as I've already alluded to, the development of offshore wind is a costly process. And it's also very time sensitive at the moment. In order to achieve these targets, people are effectively working around the clock to achieve those 20, 30 targets. So there's many, uh, most of, in fact, all of the organizations that we work with are using data. Okay, so they can all use data, but they're not leveraging the data. And we've already heard about this, you know, and that is essentially the reason of this uh, discussion today. So connected uh, digital twins is the opportunity to actually leverage the individual data sets and the individual digital twins to much greater and, in some cases, unforeseen benefits. So that's essentially what we're trying to enable with this program. So, Really, it's about trying to accelerate bringing together the problems, i.e. the problem owners and the solution providers in a virtual space with their own discrete systems, their own discrete data sets and uh, models and digital twins and bringing them together to actually affect 
those broader outcomes, which, as everybody's already said, is re really the purpose of the discussion uh, for this whole event today. So there are too many stovepipes. There's limited standardization. We're working to build something that can actually start to break that apart and uh, bring some standardization to a sector that, like many industries, hasn't really focused on that to date. So it's just been going gangbusters, trying to get things into the water as soon as possible. So what is it? A common digital environment to accelerate innovation and support the whole supply chain. OK. But what is that, really? A digital twin hosting platform. And that's what we're looking to develop. We've, uh, while my focus is on O&M, and I should have mentioned before as well, I'm based in Grimsby, up in uh, northeast Lincolnshire. And for those of you that haven't been to Grimsby, which I'm assuming is most of you, we all speak like that up there as well. So the, uh, what we're really focused on initially was O&M, so the operations and maintenance side. But it's actually now broadened into all of offshore energy. And when I say all of offshore energy, it's not just renewable energy. That's also oil and gas. So all of the oil and gas majors are moving into offshore wind at a great rate. And they're coming in with big checkbooks as well. So BP, Shell, uh, Total, all seeing that they need to make that transition into other forms of energy. And as far as they're concerned, it's just energy, whether it's uh, fuel, uh, uh, diesel, oil, gas, or electricity. So they're moving in in a big way. Most of the major players that are already in offshore wind, so Ersted, uh, Equinor, RWE, have a background in oil and gas. So the scope, as I said, is not just O&M, but also the planning, the development stages, which at the moment cost huge amounts of time and huge, you know, huge sums of money in terms of delays. And uh, also through to oil and gas. And their main focus is on making sure that their operations are as efficient as possible up until they decommission and then simulating, modeling, planning, and executing their decommissioning. So, to date, we've been working with uh, CAE, so I don't know if many of you have come across CAE, world's largest aircraft simulator manufacturer um, and developer, uh, Cognitive Business, an SME that focuses a lot of their uh, work in offshore wind, data analysis and solutions in that space, Warwick University, Microsoft, Digicat, uh, Energy Systems, Catapult, and the Net Zero Technology Centre are the folks that we've been working with on this. We've had some initial funding from Innovate UK to carry out three months of work. And so what I'm going to talk about today is essentially that three months' worth of work and what we managed to achieve in such a fairly, you know, such a small time. Um, so it was what we've, what, in fact, what we have done is really worked on developing a, a data and design governance framework and a concept of operations. How are we going to use this? What? Why is it valuable? And uh, who's going to use it? What uh, We've then developed user requirements and system design out of that, which, as you might uh, imagine, that's a fairly lengthy process. All of these things, in terms of the time that we had to carry out this project so far, uh, this early stage of the, of the project, have been carried out in parallel which means that it's really relied on excellent collaboration, excellent communication, and trust. And so that's exactly what we've been getting from the partners. And it's been fantastic to see a whole bunch of uh, um, highly capable professional uh, companies come together and work with a single vision and deliver it in, in such a small time. It's been fantastic. Um, and then we uh, also went about uh, some risk mitigation activities and developed a very high level proof of concept. So where are we on the concept to a thing sort of uh, spectrum? Uh, run about there, I reckon. So, you know, we're, we've started, but we've still got a long way to go. And with all the digital twin systems and particularly the connected, uh, in the connected space, trying to bring many, many digital twins together to find that collective benefit, I think everybody can agree we do have a long way to go. All right, this was my original diagram when I uh, first started, uh, uh, I guess, uh, thinking about this. And that was ultimately to bring the solution providers and the problem owners together in something that we referred to as the construct. Now, I'm assuming everybody's seen the matrix, right? Yes, 
Everybody's seen The Matrix? Yep, just the first movie, not the second one or third or fourth. Just the first one is the most important one. Right, in The Matrix, where uh, Morpheus is introducing Neo to The Matrix for the first time, and he plugs him in, and Neo's eyes open, and he's in this white room. And Morpheus says, this is the construct. In here, we can load whatever we need. It's our interface into The Matrix. And we can load training platforms or, or training simulations or weapons, in the case of the movie. But it has all the rules of the real world, rules like gravity. That is what we're looking to develop. It's that background environment, the world, into which these digital twins can be placed. So an initial architecture that uh, came up right at the, uh, the, the beginning from one of the partners. But importantly, use case applications. That's the, the key. All right. So what are the use cases that the industry actually want from something like this? And that's been the driver. Then working out what the partners can actually bring, what they can provide, how their data can come in, and also their models. So when we say data, it's also the models and the, the work that they've been doing in digital twins themselves. Then what is the background ecosystem? What is that background environment? Again, dynamic data, but uh, what is that background environment? And uh, the other key important uh, consideration there is outside of the core services, what is the infrastructure? So making sure that we're thinking about not having to uh, have everybody that uses Dome have a server of umpteen uh, uh, gigawatts of capability, but be able to do uh, the appropriate computations at the edge and the rest can be uh, sent out to uh, things like Azure, etc. So uh, essentially a judicious and flexible combination of cloud and local processing to enable whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. Because as you can imagine, this suddenly becomes a massive ecosystem uh, with a, uh, uh, a scalable uh, solution environment. Could be looking right down at uh, replacing a, a hydraulic pump on a turbine that will subsequently go throughout a fleet of turbines. What impact is that going to have over the next 25 years in terms of maintenance, in terms of oil temperature, servicings, etc.? Or it could be what's happening to the, uh, the seabed over the next 30 years as the scour around uh, the monopiles that are planted into the seabed. Where, are, where is that sand going, or that uh, seabed? What's its migration pattern? And what do we, where do we expect it to end up in 30 years' time? So as you can imagine, there is a hell of a lot of uh, scope for complexity in there. And so the, the concept is to have it very scalable. So we don't need to do real-time uh, interaction with everything. But for those that do, then we have that, if that makes sense. It's based on a real-time uh, uh, system, but can be faster than real time, step time, whatever's required there. These are essentially the, uh, the North Stars. So needs to have an open architecture, extensible, interoperable. So able to work not just within offshore wind or within a single company, but obviously across the whole sector, but then across sectors. Because ultimately, what we're looking at here, or what we're looking to develop, is a, a digital twin hosting platform that then connects to the grid, or it connects to the the continent, the, uh, as in the country. It is real data, or it has to be real data driven, and not just real data in, but also real data out. So it's got to be able to have that hardware in the loop connectivity, which is you know, essentially one of the, one of the fundamentals for uh, a digital twin in the, in the purest sense. But that's not for everything, because obviously we can't necessarily affect the weather. We can't affect how, uh, so in terms of outputs, once that comes through the simulation, it can take real-time inputs and uh, real feeds in, but you can't necessarily tell the weather what to do next. You can tell the, the hardware and the humans in the loop, though, in this situation. We want to reuse or repurpose as much as possible, and as was covered in the last session, it needs to be verifiable. So the outputs need to be verifiable, otherwise it's worthless. All right, I'll skip through this very quickly so you don't need to uh, worry too much about it, but uh, these are the activities that we uh, uh, went through in that, uh, in that three months of uh, action. Interestingly, so uh, 
really starting to think, uh, particularly with Warwick University, around the data security, the design guidance, what are the, what are the principles that we need to observe? And then really getting into the uh, design requirements, specification, a thousand requirements or over a thousand requirements identified in that time frame as well to say, look, it needs to have these capabilities and they're all based on use cases. Technology and standard survey, user, uh, sorry, uh, preliminary layered reference architecture I'll talk about in a minute and uh, then essentially a proof of concept. So uh, some of the people in the, um, the workshops are actually here today, so, uh, so uh, it's great to see that they're obviously still involved in the community. The candidate requirements, as I said, they cover both functional performance and to a degree some non-functional requirements. So you know, ultimately, what do we need this system to be able to do? And the next stage for this is for us to uh, feed that back to industry and say, OK, this is where we got to. What do you think? And uh, so that's, uh, like I said, the next stage. We developed a preliminary layered reference architecture as well. And I won't go into do, to too much detail in here just due to time, but uh, really making sure that uh, the infrastructure, the applications, the information layers and the business layers are actually separate but obviously communicating appropriately. And the real, you know, when we talk about secret source, like the last uh, presentation as well, the real secret source in this is going to be the APIs that provide that uh, connective tissue between the existing data sets that are out there, the existing models, and the underlying uh, system at, at, the, uh, at the center of this. Uh, right, I won't go through this in detail. So basically, assurance and integration, standards and regulation, the main reason to put this up there is to say that that was also at the core of what we're doing. We're not completely running off at a tangent here. I think the most important part is, uh, and the stuff that uh, most people identify with, is when they actually start to see something. And I'll play a video in a minute, not yet, please. Uh, but. Uh, what we did, in essence, in order to get a, uh, a rapid proof of concept together, is we took an existing uh, simulation engine, uh, a, walled, a walled garden, if you will, so a proprietary simulation engine, punched a hole in it, uh, with permission, obviously, of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, IP owners, um, and then started to connect into it a whole bunch of other digital twins and inputs, real time and simulated. So uh, we took a known, uh, a developed 3D uh, physical environment, i.e. with wave models, uh, currents, etc. Uh, what it doesn't have all the depth that we will have in the future, i.e. salinity, uh, the, uh, the sediment transportation, uh, pH values, those sorts of things, those will be uh, in the future. Then we took a uh, an existing drone model, existing drone logic or control logic as well, flight control system, built a, uh, a 3D model with the appropriate weights and gravity and connectivity of uh, Bladebug, which is another SME that we work with. Then a, an existing model ship, we built a real wind farm and really focused on the, uh, on the wind model as well, the interaction from one turbine to the next, which is really important. Um, the, the, I guess the, the live input that's coming into this and the live output is basically as the, uh, it was based on a scenario that we were developing for a, a consortium many years ago, uh, or two years ago, uh, but it, relies on a drone carrying a blade crawling device from an autonomous vessel that goes up to a, uh, to a turbine, all controlled autonomously, deploys the, the drone, uh, sorry, deploys the, the blade crawler. The drone then returns back to the vessel, blade crawler does its business, drone comes up, picks it up, and returns it back to the vessel. As you can imagine, when you've got independent technology developers on each of those areas, a lot of opportunity for rub points, a lot of opportunity for problems when you start to bring these things together. The idea being is that it's all autonomous at the end, meaning that it's controlled by an off-board mission control system. 
So how do we get that bit into the mix? Well, because we didn't have the real blade bug model, just due to time constraints, with the drone, the drone uh, basically got to a point in its logic where it said, I need input now from blade bug. I need, uh, I need to know that the blade bug is engaged on the blade. And then manually, we would press a button and go, blade bug is engaged. And then the system would carry on, if that makes sense. So what that was really to show is that it takes real time data to and from. It's able to export data in real time and take the outputs of that process back in. All right, we ran a whole bunch of tests, 40 tests uh, as part of the program as well. Some worked, some didn't. And what that did uh, was gave us an indication uh, of what wind strengths the, the system was able to uh, cope with and what, uh, I guess, angle off the leading edge. If you can imagine a blade is there like this, the wind is, in the, uh, in the first instance, is perpendicular to the blade, but that's not always the case, particularly when, a, when a, uh, a turbine is parked, it's just sitting there, right? So the wind moves. What's going to happen to the deployment of this uh, uh, blade bug on the drone, uh, sorry, on the blade by the drone if the wind changes? And so there were the tests we ran. So the next steps for us, as I mentioned earlier, we're seeking feedback from the, from the sector on the outputs that we've done or that we've developed to date. We've got, we're now uh, developing what we're calling phase two, which is an unfunded phase, working with the consortium partners, and then looking for additional support for phase, that should be phase three, uh, to actually build the MVP, uh, a minimum viable product. So we're really focusing on getting something happening, rather than necessarily just talking about it. We know we're going to learn lessons along the way, and that's the whole point. So, as I mentioned earlier, you know, our real point, our uh, real target is to progress this to a thing as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, and now we can play the video, please. Thanks, guys. Okay, so what we've got here is a low-rendered version. I'll show you a high-rendered, uh, a high-res uh, version at the end. But this is a, uh, a relatively low res. This is working in a uh, on a vessel with a real uh, uh, a real drone model uh, based on real data with a real flight control uh, system from the drone carrying the the blade crawler beneath it. So moving out towards the wind farm, and obviously I've uh, skipped it forward, to a, uh, a turbine that's actually parked out there. And the reason that we've got the, uh, the drone camera footage in here is you'll see the, uh, the way that the, the, the drone carrying this extra weight actually interacts with the turbulence from the upstream wind farms. Point to note is that the outputs, in terms of the digital twin side of things, the outputs from this turbine affect the inputs of the subsequent turbine behind it, and so on and so forth. So you end up with a, uh, uh, a wind flow that has been churned already by four or five preceding turbines. And so as it comes down in 10 metres per second with its target point, no major dramas on that one. And what you see there where it drops is it saying, is the, drone, uh, is the blade bug connected? And we go, yes. So that's the input, the output bit. And then we look at uh, another one where it's actually uh, slightly off the, off the nose, so the wind is not perpendicular this time. It's coming at from, from a slightly different angle. And you can see that it's having a lot harder time actually managing the turbulence from the upstream wind farms or from the upstream turbines. And that's because the, the wake is being steered by the prevailing wind. And so you can see that it's basically at the limit of its capability, the flight control system here. And so this is where you start to think, OK, well, uh, is, is there something we need to design around for the, uh, for the drone? The point is not, as we're looking at this, the point is not the background resolution. What it is, is really what's happening to the customers and the, the 
uh, the data sets that we're working with here. So IE, the digital twins for the drone itself. We deployed the drone, center of gravity was way off as far as the, uh, the drone was concerned and then subsequently it couldn't handle it and crashes. And there's just one more minute and that's it. So we basically, uh, so we did that uh, through uh, another one as well, which is obviously even further around. And just to, uh, to let you in on what hap happens there, the drone never makes it to the target because it can't handle the turbulence from the upstream uh, wind farm. So what is the point of doing this? Is then we work with the drone uh, developer and we say, hey man, or hey, drone developer, uh, you know, we, we need to change the way that this thing works. Now it's either something to do with the uh, flight control system in the drone or it's the way uh, the, it's carrying a slung load underneath. Whatever it is, it's struggling to the point of failure with a small change of wind direction. So then we essentially took that underlying uh, model and twin and then just ran it through a high res graphics engine. Uh, so just no changes, we just then turned it through a graphics engine. The point being is that all we've, what we've done here is we've used the same underlying model and it's uh, all external to the actual model. It's just take these outputs into a, uh, a high fidelity rendering system and you end up with that. So it's from the, from the model and from the digital twin up, not the graphics interface down, if that makes sense. Anyway, that's pretty much it. Great. Thank Thanks. You ben. Please put your hands together for Ben. <laughs> We're going to have one very quick question. This is from VJ at HS2. So, what key obstacles do you see when embedding digital twin technologies within large infrastructure projects as you've been doing? Yeah, I think, uh, and this, this comes up time and time again, uh, the main uh, obstacle is, is getting uh, the companies, certainly at the, uh, at the boardroom level, to understand the value of digital twins and be more willing to, uh, to uh, uh, engage. And they not, may not necessarily have to share their data or all their models. They can keep that stuff to themselves and keep the IP importantly to themselves, but it's the outputs of those things that we can really use. So I think that's, that's probably the key challenge is making sure that we can access the, uh, the underlying data that makes these things work. And it's not just in our sector, every sector has that. Thanks, Ben. Please put your hands together for Ben again. Thank you.